All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to this uh, seminar. It's a pleasure to have uh, today uh, here with us uh, Dr. Christopher James from Mercy of uh, uh, Company. And um, actually, this, uh, this, uh, this talk is going to be not only about uh, the breakthroughs that have, you know, that have come about in the last uh, few years in the uh, display and uh, multimedia uh, realm, but it's also a challenge to all of the students here to get your imagination kicking and let your imagination do the walking after he, he talks about these displays because they're truly impressive. Dr. James is the founder and chief technology officer of Mercive uh, at this point. And uh, he went uh, uh, to school as an undergraduate at University of Utah, majoring in computer science. And then he received his uh, PhD from University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, he founded uh, Mercive while I think he was with the uh, University, University of Kentucky, Kentucky. right? Yeah. And um, uh, where he also founded uh, the Metaverse uh, Lab. All these are twist, uh, you know, tongue twisters. Uh, he was, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, very, uh, he received uh, the prestigious award from the NSF uh, uh, career uh, panels. And in 2000, uh, of course, he founded the uh, University of Kentucky, the Center for Visualization and Environmental and Virtual Environment. And uh, his uh, academic career, of course, was very illustrious in, in, this, in, it, in that uh, it uh, uh, culminated in over 100 uh, scientific uh, papers, and uh, he was also the founding uh, father of the NSF workshop uh, series, a book, and over 15 patents. Uh, he served on many National Science Foundation panels, uh, including NATO, and uh, after, of course, he uh, founded Mercive in 2006, uh, then he started reaching in high places, including the White House with his, uh, his uh, uh, beautiful uh, displays. And uh, he even has time, which is amazing, but he even has time to, uh, to have a blog that's called The Visualist. And you can also follow him for the, your uh, uh, Twitter ge uh, geeks at, uh, uh, the uh, at The Visualist, if you want to uh, keep track of him. Anyway, it is a very uh, big pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Great. James, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, so first I want to just thank everyone for the invite to come out and um, the lecture series looks really interesting. I'm glad to be part of it. So today uh, what I want to do is a couple things. First I want to try to set the stage for some of the innovations that we created in the last 10 years and then show you how they're impacting both you know, industry, government, and places like that. And then talk a little bit about the core technology behind it and then maybe speculate as to where we're headed, what's next. Um, so that's quite a bit to do. I'll try to get through the context setting, and if I start to rant too much, of course, this kind of talk should be somewhat informal. So if you have questions or you say, wait, 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 you know, you're getting off, off track. I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't get offended if you want to interrupt me, for sure. So, um, so the title of the talk is a little bit of a mouthful. The first sentence comes out of my academic career, ubiquitous collaboration and visualization environments. And that, that was the goal of probably 10, 15 years of research. How do you make uh, visualization a more part of our everyday lives, right? Because if you look at uh, Procter & Gamble or, or the White House or places like that, there are these corporate crown jewel rooms that are called visualization rooms, and they haven't necessarily impacted like uh, places like this where you spend most of your time. So a lot of the work I did in academics was sort of that first sentence. This is the subtitle, but it's probably more interesting. How do you unlock display infrastructure? Because I think that's the action that leads to this. If you can unlock displays as shared infrastructure, really interesting things start to happen. So um, a little bit about the company. I won't get too much into the industrial side and the startup side too much. Um, before I get into the technology, but really we founded the company on this product here, this concept. The idea here is really actually not that surprising. If you look at how technology innovations have taken place, they're either at the core scientific layer or you're taking existing technologies and marrying them together with software. That's kind of the history of 25 years of technology innovation last, last while. What we're doing here is we're marrying up existing hardware solutions. So these are 
on this picture, you've got six ultra short throw projectors. So it's just like, in fact, it's this one. This guy, this is our hardware manufacturer partner makes this for smart. So it's an ultra short throw projector that they're each 1080p, but they marry up together with our technology. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The idea there was if you could have software that tie all, stitch all of those together quickly and easily, then you could build display systems that are far beyond the capability of a single hardware component. Now, hardware has its own life cycles, and we'll talk about that. And software has far faster life cycles. So if you can marry software up with hardware, you, it's sort of a big win. Um, so the company was founded on this idea, uh, came out of academic research, came out of some of my PhD work in aerial image interpretation and computer vision, because we use the same algorithms to stitch those things together that you do to stitch together urban scenes from a satellite. Um, and we've got a bunch of patents in that technology. And then the second product is what we introduced in March of 2013, and it's really sort of two sides of the same coin. How do I create displays that aren't based in hardware? Well, now how do I access displays that isn't a hardware-defined access? So, for example, when I came in here, I had to plug uh, this VGA cable into a PC to be able to connect. Well, that, that's a paradigm that's been around a long time, and I'm going to talk about that, that it's absolutely changing. It's changing so fast it'll make your head spin, to be honest. Um, so yeah, so we're a fairly small startup. Uh, we went the f somewhat traditional route of you know many, many years of scientific research. At some point, industry says that's interesting to us. Uh, we had lots of people funding research that suddenly came out of industry rather than NSF, and that's sort of a trigger point where, well, now you've got technology that maybe is, has a place in the marketplace. So with a bunch of students, we founded the company. Um, we got venture financing about a year in, and then grew the company uh, ever since and then we just sell all over the world through our resellers. So the software gets sold through either hardware packages that are bundled or you just download it and buy it. Um, but what's the vision? Why did I do all that? Because, you know, like my wife likes to say, you said you would slow down when you got tenure, and then, then I launched the company when I got tenure. Um, I'm driven by a vision, and the company is driven by the same vision. The idea is that displays are actually, if you think about it, the largest untapped infrastructure in the world. Okay, and we'll talk about why I can claim that, but the numbers are tremendous. The amount of display technology that is going into your home, into your airport, into your cafes, into your you know, university campus is unbelievable. But how you actually access it hasn't changed. So it's a very, very big untapped infrastructure. So if you were able to get to those displays, the premise is we could change the way you interact, work, learn, and play on all of those displays. So what, it, what do you have to keep in mind when you think about it? Well, the old display vision out of, even if you go all the way back to, you know, Ivan Sutherland's paper in 1967, um, how do I have high fidelity in resolution, color, and time, okay, at many, many pixels? How do I make it interactive? How do I immerse myself in a display? How do I make it accessible? Accessible meaning interaction and multimodal, potentially. And how do I make it ultimately representative of reality? Now, it doesn't mean it has to be virtual reality, like I'm in a, you know, a virtual museum. But if I'm uh, in a proteinomics lab and I'm trying to solve a protein folding problem, I want it to be representative of some physical reality at some point in the, in the visual data. So this is what drives most of the research uh, and also the products. It's actually a vision that's not new. So this is a theme you'll see me talk about a lot. These are visions that have been around since the birth of computer science. So John von Neumann, I love this quote, he basically said, look, it's obvious we have great computing power that's on the verge of breaking through. Isn't it time that we start thinking about how we develop machines with the ability to interact with those devices in a ways that are natural? That's also the birth of human-computer interaction, which is now a massive field of research in 1946. So uh, these ideas have been around a long time. They're not new. It's just the technology trends have made a lot of this stuff now very feasible in ways that weren't possible in 1946 when, you know, that's a very visionary statement <laughs> in 1946. You just had a few computers on the planet at the time, and they were much bigger than this room. So, um, But the idea of immersion, just to, to show you that this has been around a long time, this is my favorite immersive display. I've actually been in this display. Uh, it's still around. You can go visit it. In uh, 1829, artists took uh, 160 projective viewpoints from a castle in Salzburg, and they sketched them in fine detail. 
and then they composited those projective views onto a 360 degree painting. Okay? So that is, that is a projectively correct painting that if I move from this side to this side and I look this way, I see the right view. That's really interesting. It toured the country. It was actually part of a, sounds strange in 1829, but almost like an ad campaign to get people to come to Salzburg. It was funded by the city. Uh, it's really high fidelity. The color resolution is unbelievable. It's, it's, you know, it's analog color. It's interactable because I can look through a scope. The resolution is so high, I can look through scopes and see tiny little figures in the park if I aim it right. So there's an interaction device, um, and it's all projectively correct. So here's the problem with it, though, is that its refresh rate was one every two and a half years if you were to keep painting, because they took them two and a half years to create it. So it's pretty much a static scene, unfortunately. The idea, though, is that people really want it. Immersion and display technology, that's been a desire that we've had for a long, long time, the ability to represent things accurately um, in devices. So the display history has had these interesting uh, side paths off and on throughout its history. Um, Head-mounted displays, augmented reality, that's one path that people have taken. That work started back at the University of Utah, actually, with the head-mounted display. This thing was called the Sword of Democles because, um, and in fact, actually, this is a secondary version of it. I couldn't find the photograph that has the, the computing system used to sit above it. So the Sword of Democles, I don't know if you know the story of that, but it's a Greek story that says you know, it was a king, and I think he had a sword hanging by a thread, and if he made a wrong decision or something bad would happen, like the sword would fall. So students called that the Sword of Democles because they actually, the scary part to me is that this deck actually got bolted onto you. It wasn't set on you. There was some reason because of the gyros. They actually had to turn some screws to get it nice and tight against your head. <laughs> I'm not sure I would have worn it. Um, it yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, that's Ivan Sutherland, so to his credit, as a, I think he was a grad student at the time. Um, he would bore it himself, at least. So these devices all led to you know, immersion in a different way, which is I'm going to supplant reality with an immersive view of the world. Uh, it solves a lot of problems, to be honest, because in a, in a world where you can't replace it, uh, like the work we were doing with projectors, and I'm trying to paint a surface, I have to take into account the surface itself. I have to take into account the color and think of ways to sort of augment that in a way that looks realistic to you. With this, you just, hey, I've got, you know, high-resolution screens. I can't see anything else. The problem with head-mounted displays and why they really, to be honest, have never taken off is there's a thing called rotational latency that makes them, uh, you know, not good. Because what happens is you at least have to render one frame. If all the rendering equipment isn't sitting on your head and it's in a cable somewhere, you have to render a, a frame buffer. And then it has to get transmitted to the display device, and then it has to refresh the display. That means you have at least at least one frame of latency. So that's, you know, what, 16 milliseconds or something. So that means if I go like that, and the scene changes really dramatically in a very short a period of time, the scene has to catch up with me. And because of your vestibular system, that's very bad. It makes you dizzy and not feel well. So if you're a John Deere tractor, which is they've done studies with these things, and you're trying to train people on how to you know, do line of sight analysis on an engine or something for repair. All the people report, I hate this thing, I get dizzy, I get sick, and I don't want to think about the engine, I just want to take the thing off my head. So uh, that's why they haven't really taken off. They actually have a place in gaming and places like that where the rendered scene is controlled more by the, by the engine itself. Um, so yeah, the ultimate display paper came out about the same time. I mentioned it already. That was really a, a what-if paper that came out um, that said, look, if if I could build the ultimate display system, this is Ivan Sutherland's paper, I highly recommend you go read it. It's a really interesting paper. Um, then it would basically be what people now call caves. It's a room that I hit a switch and everything disappears and I'm in some other space. Um, and it actually led to some of the research that was at um, U Chicago and things that built the first few caves. It just took many decades for the technology to catch up. Um, so the other problem is this is a personal display. You can't have a shared display experience unless you're both wearing them and bumping into each other in a room. Now, uh, there are some really nice advances in this technology, mostly related actually to cognitive science. Um, things like fear response systems and things where you're testing people's ability to stand at an edge. and They do that now with head-mounted displays. I know some of the work at UNC actually is um, related to that. 
So the other approach is to not supplant your reality, but to spray out, augment the reality you're already in. And that was the approach that uh, Carolina Krisniera and some other folks at um, EVL, the research lab at UChicago, took in the late 90s, mid-90s. Before that, of course, like I've mentioned, there's always a desire to do these things. If you look deep enough, you always find someone that had the idea 30 years <laughs> before you did. Uh, this is actually, the picture on the left is actually from a system that actually got built in prototype in New York. Um, it was from Kodak. It was a three projector blended system to give you just this massive immersive theater. Never took off because of things like this boxes. I don't know if you can see it, but that actually has a technician sitting in there who would twiddle dials like constantly to do the vibrations to try to keep it aligned and it just never worked. Um, so that's related to some of the work that we were doing to launch the company. Um, at the time, you know, I, I had visited a few centers that had caves and thought, these are great. Why do not high school students have these? Well, let's think it through. Each piece has to have electro, optical, mechanical, specialized gears to twiddle dials to make these edges line up perfectly, right? And then you have to have really high-end rendering pipelines that know how to projectively distort the image at real time as you move your head so that the corners stay straight, things like that. Um, so the research program we took on at the time was to say, well, look, that's never going to work. You need a sensor that looks at the display itself, a camera looking at the display, and aligns it automatically for you so that you could just plunk down a bunch of projectors and paint a surface and then, and then go. So at the time, in uh, 2004, we built the highest resolution cave on the planet, and I did it by using borrowed sales projectors from the Epson regional reps. They brought in... 80 projectors. I'll actually show you some images of this. And we built displays out of them. The first thing we did is we hung them all over the ceiling in one of our labs and painted every surface, projected everywhere. So 80 times, you know, XGA resolution at the time, that's a lot of pixels, calibrated, and it cost us almost nothing. This cave right here that you're looking at um, is a C6 cave from a company that was selling them at the time. It cost about three and a half million dollars. So you know, it's a dramatically different approach. They're hard to maintain and things like that. So all these sort of sidebar ways to get better displays, ways to rethink we use displays, um, and I'll talk, I'm sort of holding back talking about the, the bigger paradigm shift that's even happening in the consumer space about displays. We'll get to that. Um, they're all driven by underlying science. So I don't want to leave that out of the story. I think it's important. It's really interesting. All these scientific advances are, have been They've actually been amazing. If you look at the pacing of technology, especially recently, because now consumer demand is driving display innovation, which has changed the whole landscape of how it's done. Uh, if you go back far enough, and in fact, you can still find CRTs, you know, in some government places. They still have them in flight simulators, like the, the uh, you know, the scopes and things like that. CRT, um, it's a, just a magnetically aimed gun. I don't know if people know about this technology much, but it's just a phosphor glass plate and you strike it. They're too young. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, you're steering an electron gun, right? You're shooting electrons at a screen and it's, it scans out on the screen fast enough. And when you excite the phosphor molecules, they emit a photon. And the photon is usually an ugly green, unfortunately. <laughs> and then you see an image. Um, so th it's called electron absorption, but that's important because almost every display is built on that premise, literally. Other than maybe, well, there's, we don't need to go into that. But the quantum dot stuff is maybe related. So if you shoot an electron gun at this guy, it emits a photon, you see it, and then there's an after image that has to fade. Uh, I don't know if, if, we've, if you guys have talked about this kind of technology before, but in ECE probably it comes up, but early memory systems were actually built with CRTs. You could actually store data in a CRT as well. All you have to do is, because when, when you strike a molecule, it creates a when you absorb the electron and it emits a photon, um, a small area on that screen now has a negative charge, and around it is a positive charge. So they call it the negative, the well. And that well has, a, has information. It's been written there. And it lasts quite a while. I mean, quite a while in computer terms is about a little less than a second. And so if you constantly re-update, you have short-term memory stored in a CRT tube. Tektronics. Yeah, tektronics, exactly. So their whole industry is built out of that idea. Um, it sounds crazy now that you would store something on something I could actually pick up and move around, but... Is this one cycle memory make it difficult to 
change the scene because like you're having a blurry version of one second ago? Yeah, so on the memory side, you were not using it as a display. So they would actually cap it with a piece of metal to, to try to actually isolate charge and things like that. Um, for displays, yeah. That's why, you know, if you watch a movie where they're showing the radar sweep, that's a CRT, and you'll see the after image constantly. So it really was not, there's no way that CRT technologies are good for things like 60 hertz refresh rate. No way. They just have way too much of an after image. There it's was like some the work. Savers. Yeah, exactly. It's a screensaver. <laughs> Uh, there has been some work, though, that uh, people are revisiting it for other reasons and um, has to do with things like memory and how you, how you actually use it as a compute device. Uh, so LCD, this is probably what people are more familiar with. LCD has a very cool history to it. Um, RCA at the time was really looking for innovative uh, technologies. And uh, I should have brought the quote, but the president of R&D at RCA in 19, I think it was probably 63, uh, came to his engineers and said, they used to do these things at RCA called grand challenges. He would write on the board, here's the grand challenge for the year. And whoever wants to work on it, you know, raise your hand, you get budget, you go after this problem. And it was actually a mobile display. Um, he said the vision, the grand, and they were supposed to be impossible, right? Like he spells out something so impossible that you have to back up and you find innovations to get there. Uh, I want to go to the beach. I want to sit there, and I want to watch television on a color panel that I've taken with me in my picnic basket. So that's amazing. That's the iPad, really, right? That's what he was thinking of. Uh, at the time, they were like, that's impossible. There's no way we'll ever do that. Um, you know, I do it on the plane all the time now. <laughs> so what happened is there were some guys working in, uh, you know, in, in chemistry and uh, material sciences, and they were looking at a class of a, of a of materials that are called twisted pneumatics. And they're really interesting. When you run a current through it, the molecules structure. They take structure. So they'll become parallel. Uh, and when that happens, they can polarize light. So liquid crystals are one of the better, more efficient materials that become you know, polarized quickly when you run a current through them. So then how do you turn that into a display? So what happened is there were some scientists at RCA working on that class of materials for another reason. This grand challenge came around, and someone said, that's cool. How about I run a current through that material, and I can get a really thin piece of glass that has polarizing on one side and a polarizer on the other. And when I run a current through this guy, he this LCD panel becomes polarized. So now I force polarization, and I can either block or not block light that goes through this tiny little panel. And then we're talking about little panels, like pixel size. So this was the first hey, you know, now we're dividing our displays up into things called pixels. So it's great innovation. It led to really interesting stuff, and it led to the whole LCD explosion in consumer displays. I mean, a lot of televisions still are sold with LCD technologies in embedded in them. And then OLED uh, is a more modern uh, display technology. LED is just, it's different than that because this guy needs a backlight. So light has to hit the system before I can polarize and then selectively pick RGB colors and pass it. LEDs actually emit um, on their own just by running a current. And their principle is similar to the two plates, but they're actually two pieces of metal that have either an excess or, a, or a, you know, too few electrons. And so the idea is if I run a current through here, I can chase electrons across one plate, it strikes the other, and then you're back to the old absorption principle where now I will emit a photon when that happens because I'm falling into an electron hole. Um, it's really interesting technology. It's gone crazy. I mean, you can read about it everywhere. <coughs> I probably don't need to go into all the details here, but what's happened is there's been a steady progression of these things becoming much, much more efficient. Like, you know, the guys for that just won the Nobel Prize, right? What did they do? They did blue LED research. They were able to introduce the blue LED. So that made LEDs now a viable light source because you can get RGB again and the three primaries for color. That's right, and far, far more efficient. I mean, the early LEDs, you were running massive current through it, and you know, they also didn't have a long shelf life. So there's all these weird manufacturing challenges that they overcame too. Um, and then quantum dots, I won't get into that, but they're basically like OLEDs, but they're exhibiting a quantum principle where I'm not going to emit a, a a distribution of wavelengths, I emit literally one wavelength. So they're incredibly good at preserving color, which has been a really interesting uh, development. So now there are some folks I know in the industry that are talking about, like, you know, 
color gamuts that are twice the color gamuts that normal displays have by using you know these quantum dots. So I guess the point here is you know science drives all the stuff I was just showing you. These more engineering, hey, let's go look at what happens when I mount a display on my head. But here's the sad story. <laughs> so when I think about display technology, I actually don't think that there's been much change. So if I think about the Xerox Star, this is a personal computer in 1981. It's got a mouse, a keyboard attached, and a rendering engine that illuminates this display for me to interact with it. This is 2006. It's smaller, it's lighter, sure. The resolution's gone up a little bit, uh, but it hasn't been that dramatic, actually. If you compare, and I will, I'll show you a graph where I'm going to compare these changes to other parts of your computing environment. They've changed far more. This is the brand new Galaxy NXT. It's got a keyboard, it has a built-in mouse pad, and it's got a display, and it's one content source rendering to this screen for you to interact with it. It's just really small and fast, right? The other pieces of that device have become really interesting. The display hasn't changed. The paradigm, the way you use displays, is almost no different. So uh, some colleagues of mine uh, and I went back in 2011, and um, this was a painful study to build, but it was really interesting. We went back and plotted consumer cost per unit performance for all of these different technologies. And the fact that most of them have a law that drive it and displays don't tell you, a, tell you something, right? So processors, everyone knows Moore's Law, and that's the processor speed growth since 1989 to 2011, okay? Relative size now, and we have a unit size that we plotted in the graphs. And then um, network bandwidth, camera resolution. This one, to be fair, actually, um, was driven by consumer need now, even in that, is that early. Hard disk capacity, of course, just went nuts. And large format display, hardly changed, really. Uh, the re why is that the case? Well, there's actually a couple of reasons. One of them, for sure, is there's not a consumer driving need to change the display. And then you ask, well, why not? Well, because it's still used the same way. It's used for the exact same thing it was used for when we first stopped you know, having to interface with punch cards, really. So. What we do in response to this is we say, okay, so let's take our technology, the first product I was talking about that takes the camera and aligns projectors automatically and gives you lots and lots of pixels for cheap. So this guy is a 80 projector wall. There's a rack behind this, literally just shelves, with a PC with four outputs and four projectors on each shelf. And we built it overnight at this thing that was like this thing called the Idea Festival for n at some Nobel Prize event. And uh, it's crazy resolution. I'm trying to look where I put the resolution of that. So 80, I think it was like 60 million, yeah. 75 million pixels. So 75 million pixels, 75 megapixel display across that. And so then what we did is we had artists and scientists submit artwork and their visual research results, and we s ran it on a loop. And it was really fun. It was amazing. All it was was software. And it's actually fairly straightforward computer vision. I'll tell you a little bit how it works. You just put a camera there. So we were working on, you know, there's all the papers and things like that at the time. We worked on light field rendering using these because you can actually render a real physical light field with tons and tons of projectors, right? Like if I hold up this coffee cup, there are light rays that are coming into your eyes. And if I take two planes and talk about each of those light rays parameterized by two points on each plane and its energy and color, that's a fairly low dimensional space. So we had a rendering algorithm that actually could take projectors like this. It's going to sound weird, but you put on sunglasses and you look into them and you see a scene because we would render the light field out of all those projectors. Now, you could only do that if they're highly calibrated, and that means they have, you have to know where every single light ray coming out of those is really accurately. Um, and so this research led to the sole product that we launched the company on. You can imagine that um, you know, it took off pretty quick because this is a very cheap way to build very high-resolution display systems. You could build one in here that covers that whole wall just by finding enough projectors and running the software. So how does it work a little bit? Um, here's how it works. So Projector A illuminates this surface, right, on a point. 
so does this projector V with this ray, because they're overlapping, you know, each other. Okay. So a camera makes a measurement of that point. Now, I'm making it sound easy, and I don't want to do disrespect to some of my PhD students whose whole PhD was, how do I accurately estimate the center of that point on an unknown surface shape? So there's a lot I'm glossing over here. But you can imagine if you know the, the function of that dot, if you know that it's a Gaussian fiducial, for example, and you know the projective geometry that distorts that dot, then I know that how many parameters are unknown and how many measurements I need to make to start to pin it down. So what happens is this guy makes many measurements, uh, estimates statistically where the very, very accurate center of this is in here. Okay? And if you've done that, um, now you have to do robust statistics because sometimes this dot will think it's clear up here. Even, even if you're incredibly accurate, there are times where your camera line noise or something kicks a point out. But what you're doing is you're estimating the surface shape and you're estimating the center of that dot in the camera simultaneously. So if I start to believe that it's curved in a certain way over this local area, then another estimate says it's not, it's flat surface. And I just say, well, that must be wrong, and I'm going to put it back. Once you've done that enough times, you can do two things. You can reconstruct the surface super accurately, and you now know how to render a scene so that for any eye point in here, I see what I want to see. So the way you do that is you take the, it's a two-pass rendering. You don't really do it as two-pass, but in computer graphics, uh, it's easy to think about it this way. You uh, take the scene you want to render, you back project it, you compute the back projected ray that intersects with that surface, and then you compute where it hits this projector. So now I know, okay, you want to see a floating coffee cup? Well, then I figure out where does that coffee cup handle hit the surface? Where does it hit each of the projector's pixels? And now I, now I know what they need to render, right? And now they actually do the rendering forward. So that's why it's called two-pass rendering. You inverse render the scene, and then you project it back into the world, and now it looks correct from any eye point. So that means you could put on a head tracker, and we ran a bunch of studies with um, educational studies where students would come in. Uh, they had already, you know, we had someone paid to build us 3D models that you could render into our rooms. Students would come in and put on a head tracker and then explore things like the Ashmolean stone and things like that as part of their educational program. And we actually showed at SIGGRAPH uh, five years, six years ago, that there's a dramatic uptick that you learn more when you are immersed in what you're learning about rather than just seeing it in a PowerPoint like I'm doing here, which is really boring. Uh, so here's some examples of that technology in action, because then I'm going to go on to what we're doing today. This is what put it, gave us the groundwork. So this is a 17 projector dome. Um, I think this was US Air Force, that's right. It, so it was a training system for air controllers, so guys that look through scopes and things. The challenge they came to us with was, well, gee, if we just have one big projector on an optical bend and they look through a scope, it looks horrible because it's a real scope. And you know, Lockheed Martin was happy to sell them this incredibly expensive virtual scope with an LCD in it and things like that. And we said, well, you know what? Get rid of all that stuff. Just aim at it with a scope and make it high res enough on the display. So uh, in about 20 minutes, you can calibrate these things into that. So that's just, you can actually see, I'll go back. You can see the tripod and the camera that's plunked down in the middle. And it's actually on a pan tilt unit because the camera has to move. Well, structure for motion comes into play then, and you just add some other algorithms, and you can actually do the same technique I showed you on the other page, and you align everything. So this product does color, uh, intensity, and geometry. Now, color, there's, is, there's a lot of work to still be done there, but you were able to blend colors together. Uh, this is the example in the White House where they already had a lot of pixels. They just look crazy bad. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so you can see... The seams, these are called video cubes. You guys have tons of them in the library over there. Um, they just are a big TV set. Think of it like a TV with a back projection system in it, and they're industrial strength. They rack six of those up. It's six times HD, and then they have all this specialized hardware to distribute it on those screens. When I first went in there, they were running CNN, literally, and there was like this ticker, and it would go to the middle guy and back up, and I'm like, oh, my God. So the story here is kind of funny. I have to tell it. I, I don't want to run out of time, but... So um, the reason this changed is there was a press conference with uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan. And with these, they're called mullions or seams between the screens. It was going to be a press event where they were going to have photographs of the event. The problem is you can't define where, if it's a VTC call, you can't tell where his head's going to be. And it was like right here, the whole call, like this. 
And they're like, we can't use any of those photos. Change this display. <laughs> so uh, Harris Corporation found us, and we installed our software. So this is a single screen now. We didn't change the hardware at all. We just took the glass fronts of all those cubes and moved them back and then ran our algorithms, and now it's a seamless image without any of those color spots or anything like that. This is an example of uh, where we sell that product a lot, uh, product visualization theaters, things like that. So Coca-Cola, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Diageo Liquor in Sao Paulo, they all have like these theaters where they're designing their next label and things like that. It's really amazing. And they do store shelf visualization, stuff like that. This is uh, three projectors HD on a blend on a big curve wall in one of their theaters. So, so now to the new product. Why, w what happened? So what happened is I was traveling around into all these theaters, um, and it actually happened at this one, I had probably heard this story three or four times, like, wow, this is great, now how do I connect to it? Um, and then they would go off and talk to this AV reseller that would sell them big pieces of hardware to do video switching, things like that. Um, in fact, Extron is right there, so that's what we're using right now. Um, so we sold 24 million pixel display to Disney Imagineering, and the idea originally was they're going to use it for theme park visualization. But instead, because they put it in a room just like this, they said to me, well, wow, Chris, this is great. We have meetings in here all the time. Can we just all put our laptops on that big screen? And I get back on a plane thinking, well, that's a shame. I'm afraid to tell them that to spend like three times the amount of money to have video switching in that room to use what we just sold them. So I literally on the plane back wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation, at least started anyway. It's much longer than a three-hour exercise. But, um, that said, look, this has to change. There's no way giant, archaic pieces of hardware should be defining how we access our pixel landscape. Right? It's just strange that it hasn't changed in this long. Um, if you look at the ways you connect to displays, it's like this. One person takes a cable and connects to it. Or you go by systems like we're using here where you start to have to have a video switch that's specialized rack gear, has a limited number of inputs. And, you know, for, for people in your generation, this will sound bizarre. But if you go and say, OK, I want, I want an eight-input input video switch with a uh, matrix switching, they'll call it, which is the ability to take any of the eight inputs and put it on one of the eight outputs. OK, sounds easy, right? Well, that's like already you're probably spending $1,000. And oh, by the way, if you want to do things like have them actually be in the same space, like on one big display, now you're talking $15,000. And input one can never go behind input two, which is like, wow, well, that makes sense if you're designing hardware. It doesn't make sense if you're like looking at modern computer graphics. It's, well, why wouldn't you just render it first? I don't know. So the idea was we're going to fix that. And it's a big, big problem. So this is, um, for me, the reason I get up in the morning every day. Last year, there were 14 trillion pixels put into our shared spaces. New, not already existing, new, new pixels. So those are, uh, and that's from a research study from iSupply. It's only displays that are over 60 inches used for more than one u user. So in truly, like hanging on a wall, you should be able to use them kind of pixels, 14 trillion. And it's not a surprise if you think about it. I mean, spaces like this are unbelievable, the number of LEDs that are being deployed. If you even go into indoor spaces like this, I mean, what is that? How many HD screens is that? That's a whole lot of data, tons. And none of it's accessible. So we're looking at ways to change that. So Solstice came out of that National Science Foundation-funded project. What it ended up happening is we built out um, the ability for any device like this to stream media over Wi-Fi. Well, now it's starting to sound less exciting because I can do that at home with my direct TV. But four years ago, uh, that was impossible. If you plotted um, the available bandwidth over time and compression technologies, so how much do I need to push over that same pipe, of course it starts to become clear, wait a minute, so at some point in the world's history, HD over Wi-Fi seems obvious. It'll happen. So that was the whole premise of the proposal is we'll be there when that happens to manage how you move pixels through that infrastructure. Because now there's new problems about who owns what, how do I access it, how do I stream media, how do I control it when I'm streaming to it. And the mantra we have um, is definitely it can't be, we can't become Crestron. That's sort of like Extron, the same company. Because 
they've sort of solved all these problems, but they solved them in the 60s and 70s with video switches and you unplug cables and it's UI that's really hard to use and things like that. We want to be driven by more consumer. So what does it look like? Um, so it's all software. Uh, you need a compute platform, though, to drive it. So here's a couple displays sitting in your space. These are PCs. We actually ported it now to Android. I don't know if I've told you guys about that yet, but we're, we're about to launch an Android small set-top box that will drive the display as well. So these guys just sit on the network. It can be any network at all. And then all these different devices want to share media to one or more of those displays because they can also talk to one another. So what we call that display federation, where displays register with one another. So when you turn them on and they're running our software, they'll say, I'm here. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm a standalone display. I can't get any of your media. Leave me alone. For the federal government, we've actually delivered stuff where they can say things like, I'm a mirror of you. So if someone posts media on you, then it shows up here. Or I'm to the left of you. So you can drag media with your iPhone and move it all the way around the room if you want. On these guys, you install software. So you can get it for free in the App Store, or you download it actually directly off these devices. They'll serve it over port 80, like a, you know, like a web server. And then when you're connected, there's a really interesting technical challenge here. It's maybe an architectural challenge more than anything. How do you know where displays are? It's a chicken and egg, right? So you have to have a discovery mechanism of some kind. Well, uh, in large corporate networks, you can never broadcast because they'll turn that off, and the first switch that sees it will throw those packets on the ground. So broadcast works if you're on a small network, like the one I'm running here. Um, it'll just use UDP, and everybody sees a list of all the available displays. Just like when you're clicking your Wi-Fi button and you see all the display names, like, you know, in my case, Delta, Lounge, Hilton Hotel, I don't know. Um, and then you pick one, right, based on the name. You can do that with displays now using Solstice. I just click here. I, if, if you guys were running Solstice in here, I would have brought this laptop in, clicked Discover, looked at the screen to see the name of it, and connected and be done. I wouldn't have had to go through specialized gear that's sitting in the corner like that because the display is part of the network infrastructure at that point. Uh, so we can also do what's called SDS. So if you can't do broadcast, we actually have a service, this TCP IP based service that you install on a third party box somewhere, like your IT guys would have it running. And then every display knows where that is and they list themselves directly rather than having to broadcast. Yeah? Um, I'm assuming that the amount of computation that you need to manage, you know, I don't know, 100 displays is beyond the desktop. So are you guys running on GPUs? You have specialized hardware for that? Yeah, no, it's good news because GPUs are so great. So um, there's two things going on. Video decode is critical because it's all video. So you've got an encode challenge because the client, so if we're streaming off this desktop, he's got to encode according to some format, like H.264 or something. It's got to get over the network, and it's got to get decoded and then rendered in time. Uh, GPUs can do that crazy fast. Uh, thanks to things like everybody wanting to watch YouTube videos on their phones, video decoding chips have become really cheap now. So uh, Intel, two, three years ago, with the QuickSync architecture, started embedding H.264 decoders on basically every platform now. They're really, really cheap. Uh, we use kind of a boutique encoder that can use H.264 if it's there, but we've got a bunch of pro proprietary tricks that make it go faster, too, because we've got... You know, our challenge is you might have 16 people all streaming to the same display, and you can't have an implosion on the decoder there. So we've got some interwoven decoders that are pretty quick. Yeah, that's a good question. But it's not specialized. It's all com commodity. So, in fact, like you can buy a Solstice display from one of our resellers on an Intel Nook, the next unit of computing, as like a bundle. And that thing is just in in the integrated graphics. Um, Okay, so then when you connect, you connect to conference room tw 10. I'm not going to go through all this because I'm going to give you a live demo, which I think is way more fun. You stream media over the Wi-Fi. Um, but it's cross-platform, and that's critical because if you're going to really have access to displays as infrastructure, you can't be like, well, which app and which device because then you're back to the which cable and which dongle. In fact, I was just at a different university, and they were showing me a table where they bought a ring of all the adapters for all the different <laughs> devices that students could come in. It was $170. Uh, and it was like bolted to the table on this long cable that you would pull out. And it's like, oh, <laughs> please, that's so crazy. 
Um, I mean, my guy doesn't even have video out anymore, right? So there's, there's first you have the challenge of how would I wire up all these devices? In fact, they've done the math. Um, let's see, so I'm going to do the math in my head out loud. So at UMass Amherst, where I went, there's about 35,000 students that join campus every year, and they're all carrying a phone. So suppose I'm the IT guy, and I say, you know what, I want to wire up my students so they can all use all the displays we're putting in all those student study rooms and things, right? So uh, I went and looked, and they have hundreds of displays. Let's see, two, 3,000 displays. If we went and bought an eight-input video switch, let's call that 850 bucks. That's like three plus $3 million, $3.7 million in costs. That's unbelievable just to have me go like this to that. When I come into a room, I'd have to have a cable and a video switch that somebody bought. So to me, that's just never going to happen. Plus the fact that this now is just USB. Now there's, there are standards that are HDMI over USB, but then I got to buy a dongle of some kind, and I'm responsible for that. It's just not going to happen. So to, you know, a lot of the times we'll sell Solstice into education because it's rooms like this where like somebody might say, well, I've got a cool thing I want to show you, and it comes up on the screen. And that's totally different. That's just software streaming over this existing network that we're already in. Uh, you can also interact with Solstice. I won't do it. Here. Is this a touch-enabled display? No, I just asked that. It would have been. Oh, if I went through here, <laughs> oh, that's too bad. I'm running. I'm actually. I've been cheating. I'm running Solstice right now on my own little demo. So this is a Wi-Fi adapter and a PC, right? And I didn't plug this PC in. I plugged this PC into the switch. So I'm actually untethered here because I've been using Solstice the whole time. So if I hit Escape, uh, you'll see that I'm running Solstice because I can open up the Solstice UI and do things like take myself out of view, right? And then put my desktop back. So that's, uh, that's all Wi-Fi wi streaming, and it's 60 hertz off of this guy. So where it gets interesting is, well, so great, you snip the video cable. We don't have to have video cables anymore. But it gets more interesting when you say, well, what happens when I snip the video cable? So I have this phone, and I'm on Wi-Fi too. So I'm going to join the display. I don't know if you can see it, but you see I just joined. It says Christopher just joined. So I'm going to add some media to that. I guess I'll do this. Take a picture. And I'm going to post that to the screen. So now we have two things on the display and two users. And what's more interesting is I don't have to have specialized control or third-party hardware. I just use my app. So I click the room view. You can't really see it that well here, but... I can say, let's put that on that side. But let's just look at the desktop, right, or bring it back. So there's a connectivity issue. How do I discover the displays? We have that solved. You click it. Um, once you've joined, in fact, I'm going to pull my, this will be a little bit mind-boggling because we're looking at a demo through a demo, but I'm going to take that out of view. You can see my desktop. This is the UI in the corner. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. So that's the user interface. It's going to be mirrors within mirrors because we're looking at the user interface through the user interface. But when I go back, you can see I joined, and I can, I can stop sharing my desktop. I can share files. So if I've got feature-length videos, I can stream those. Uh, I can share just an application window. I can stop sharing everything. And then I can go to that view that allows me to control it. So I'm going to – it's really unlimited. I can share things like, I don't know, um, how about an MP4 video file? So when I do that, um, I can control it from here, right? Because I'm in the session with my phone. So I can click that guy, look at it bigger, say go back, pull that desktop out of view. And in fact, I can even pause the video from here or mute it, which is what I really wanted to do. Um, and the number of sources when you're doing this kind of stuff is unlimited. In fact, I'll do it from my iPad, too. So I'm going to add uh, a bunch of media files. Let's say we want to look at architectural drawings. Not so good at multi-select, I guess. There we go. So now I'm sharing a whole bunch of stuff, right? Um, side by side, treating that like a shared workspace rather than it's a whoever had the video cable defines who's going to talk in the meeting, right? So if I launch the app on an iPad, for example, uh, I can see Solstice demo. So then I just join it. 
and when I've joined, I'm in, and I can see, I can share media, I can take photos, I can mirror my whole iPad up to there, and I can also control like this using the built-in touch. Now we're in what's called snap to grid mode. I can go into free form, in fact, so I can do whatever I want. Just use the pinch to zoom, grab media, and move it wherever I want. Bring this video back up, and we'll play them again. That's a great question. So I've been showing this to you in what we call round table mode, where it's just paper on a table. We're all touching and moving media, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a moderation mode. So when you put it in moderator mode, when I connect it, I would get asked, are you a guest or are you a presenter? Guests have to have presenter privileges to post. So what would happen is if you decided you want to post a picture off your phone and you're only a guest, I get a pop-up that says, somebody's trying to post and it shows the live video of what you want to post so that I can preview it here. I mean, I used to teach classes. I know what would happen <laughs> if, you know, my 335 graphics course or something, undergrads would just start throwing media on the screen right in the middle of the lecture, right? You don't want that. You can also uh, display a session key on the screen so that people in the hallway can't post. They would have to see the screen to be able to post to it. Yep. Maybe a related question. So, like, let's say I want to look at one of those items in detail, and I have an iPad. Can I pull that up on my screen? That's a okay. Yeah, that's a good question. It's one of the most requested features right now, and it's it's interesting because it takes Solstice from a proximate collaboration tool, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because you could normally just look at the big screen in the in the conference room, uh, to more like a WebEx almost, where now you don't have to be in the room at all. It turns out a lot of our enterprise customers, our corporate users, are already doing that, and they're saying, well, I can see it, but it's kind of blurry. Why? Well, because these are, these are interaction elements, right? They're intended for you to be able to control, but still look up at the screen and maybe scale it in here. I'm not giving you higher res. I'm giving you the same loop back because I don't want to kill your network. So uh, by mid-next year, we'll have a tear-out capability that you can press and hold a media element, and one of these menu items will say, tear this out at high res and you get a huge high res you can pan and zoom and then even save it because it's funny how um, you know we've solved the sort of video media streaming component so I can go into you know anywhere immersive for example I go into conference rooms and I just present off my iPad without thinking about it but as soon as you've done that it's amazing to me how how badly everyone wants to collaborate because the feature requests we get are things like you know I might be at home or can I annotate that or can I you know, can we both, can we do things like transparency? Uh, Condé Nast Magazine, uh, for example, they <coughs> post tons of posts, right? And they're looking at different cover designs for magazines. Some of the guys are in New York, some are in San Francisco. And they want to be able to actually do transparency overlay. They'll pin two posts together and then change the transparency one to see, well, how is that different? I don't, because they're so subtle. Mm -hmm. It's amazing the number of feature requests we're getting. Yeah. So uh, what you are doing now is that um, you do everything, everything and then everyone can see it on the screen. But maybe someone wants to zoom in that picture and the other one wants to zoom in that Right. Picture. And yeah, and that's a good point. Without dis disturbing the other. Yeah, and that's why we're going to do the tear out that way, so that you could on your personal device take one post out and look at it, annotate it, save it, without touching the screen. We, we did build it purposely that way, that we don't want people over here doing something different very often. Mm -hmm. Because the whole concept is, originally anyway, is, you know, six, seven people in a room, they're collaborating on something really important, decision making. You know, most of our customers are in like oil and gas, places like that, where it's a geophysics guy with a laptop, uh, the drill engineer, and then someone that literally has an iPad that took a bunch of photographs of the drill site and wants to show them on the screen at the same time. So they don't care if they're all kind of working together. Um, as soon as you start to create capability uh, for the individual back on their device, it's interesting. It, that that high-res tarot will be the first time we do that. Yep. So that's, that's I'm not going back into PowerPoint because we did not enough PowerPoint. And I think I'm uh, five minutes early, so I can definitely take questions, eh? Yes, definitely. Anything else? <coughs> So what does a, at some point you, you, you're going to run into bandwidth problems, right? I mean, uh, yeah. so, so where, 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 where's, that, uh, where's that wall? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so you want to do two things. You want to have 
you know, obviously you want to have high compression ratios if you can get away with them, when you can get away with them. Um, so we have a couple things going on. One is, for example, a, a scene like this, uh, the entropy of this scene is far different than a really high resolution oil and gas seismic return data set. We encode differently for those scenes. Now, most encoders out of the box will do that. They'll give you better compression ratios. Uh, but we have an upfront entropy encoder that detects what's happening. And we, on a block-by-block -block basis, we can do VP8 encode. We can do H.264 on this piece, because I know that H.264 will do really great here, but the new stuff from Google is better over here, for example. So that's some of our secret sauce. We're selectively encoding differently. The other thing you have to be careful about is uh, how you service the simultaneous feeds, because you can't create big backlogs on the devices, or they'll just buffer and start to fall behind. Um, so we have this round robining scheme. It's really similar to uh, technology that came out of like uh, pipelining for compilers and things, where we're able to pipeline service requests to all the different devices. And then another piece is the server has to be able to tell these guys, oh, slow down. <laughs> Don't give me 60 hertz HD right now. I've already got four things like that on the screen. And so we'll tell it, you know, the server actually informs the encoders here to say start to compress higher. On average, we get about 500 to 1, and it still looks super crisp, and you can read fi fine text and things like that. But yeah, there's a there th you're using bandwidth. You're eventually going to. We've done a bunch of studies, though. Um, if you have four people in a meeting for an hour, and one person's streaming HD constantly, and three others are using applications, and they're actually working, we are getting about less than a megabit per second on average utilization, and then a peak of 4.3, I think, are the numbers. So. That's like Spotify, you know. So all these guys probably run Spotify on the network all day long. So <laughs> like my engineers, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. And I'm sure you've talked about it. We can stream multiple displays, right? Not just this one, but Yeah, this. yeah. Um, how does that make the system more complicated? Is it like some sort of exponential type of thing, or is it... Um, and Let's see, that's a good question. Some stuff over there, some stuff over here. I'm not saying mirrors. Right. So the way we do that is the displays register with each other, and they give each other, like think of an infinite palette, infinite 2D plane, and then each display subscribes to a region in that plane. And so when I connect to that screen, I know when I stream a piece of media, it has an offset address of something, and it'll disappear if it goes here. Right now, because he doesn't have a neighbor, it can't go there. So if you set up in our tool ahead of time that that screen is sitting to the left of that guy, when I drag media, it goes there. But how do I do that without it becoming exponentially explosive? Mm -hmm. um, the trick is you can't, so the brain dead way would be to broadcast data. To be, I mean, if I was having to do it in one semester, I would have done it that way. Um, the way it works is this guy, it, he receives the first frame because that's who I'm connected to. But as soon as I start to drag him off frame, he tells the encoder, me, that you now have a new destination, and it's this IP address in the socket. If you took the data, there's actually uh, some competitive products that aren't, aren't even in this space, but they, they're competitive technologies from VNC, real VNC. If you were to drag this off view, and then this guy, this PC now has to tell that PC and starts to forward the packets, then you have exponential problems, right? Because everyone's now forwarding to everyone else on the network, which is yeah, not good. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like the really large scale future applications, like you showed the Times Square and like the billboards in Hong Kong yeah. and stuff like that, in really public spaces where there has to be some method of like control yeah. over the kind of stuff that goes uh, up on the screen, yep. is there, you guys already have a system in, in mind for how to deal with that? Like, can it identify that someone's, like, throwing porn up yeah, on the billboard? Yeah, exactly. So my method is we won't solve that problem with someone else will. <laughs> okay. But what we're doing is, and this is actually a requirement from the U.S. government. They're mm -hmm. a big customer of ours. They, um, they want to be able to basically put their own thing in the pipeline. So if you send me data and I'm the screen, before it reaches me, I want to be able to do things like detect change, right? Because then I could, on the display, flash it or something cool. I don't know all the different things people want to do as they're throwing pixels between displays, but I know that we should have an architecture that supports it. And that's one of the use cases. We've been talking to, like, Buffalo Wild Wings, mm -hmm. believe it or not, because <laughs> someone on my board somehow knows someone at Buffalo <laughs> Wild Wings. Never even been in one. <laughs> um, they, they're interested, and that, that's their biggest concern. They have 
all kinds of resources to go hire developers. I mean, I, I'm a computer vision guy. Back way back in the day, there was people writing porn detectors for sure that were pretty good. So you could imagine writing plugins into our SDK and then deploying that way. Yeah. Any other questions? Can, can this thing, do you foresee this thing scaling to uh, higher levels of tree architecture? Uh, uh, you mean it, in the number of displays or? No, in the serving. Uh, serving in the oh, uh, we. Just so, so you have potentially uh, several views. Uh, I see. So that you would have data going here but also to there, or do you mean hierarchy in what sense? In the number of clients? number of displays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me speak to that a little bit. One of the biggest requirements mm -hmm. in education uh, came out of a project at MIT called TEAL, Team Enabled Active Learning. Um, and what's big in education now, maybe not at big universities, but in like K through 12, you have teams of kids working together and then an instructor that then pulls the data. Right here, I mean we have this right. feed going to several sites. Right. Each site has different constraints. Right. And therefore, different display. Right. Of, of the same. Yep. So we have, uh, yeah. So that's on the roadmap. We have a thing called the IT dashboard that, if you were to run it like on this laptop here, you could see all the solstice displays on the network and manage them, things like that. That's where we're going to build display hierarchies for the educational space because it would be like, hey, those four students can share to that screen, but I am higher up in the hierarchy and I can pull that screen in as a post to me. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah, so that's exactly what we're headed towards. Because there's no reason why I can't take an H.264 feed of that whole screen and just connect to this guy as a post and then see it as one of these elements. Then I could say, let's look at all the data on table one, all the data on table two. Let's look at New York City, right? It's no different. So that, that tool was built because we want to be able to you know, have a drag and drop, construct your hierarchy. That, that educators understand. Yeah. But you do have to be careful of the bandwidth there. The biggest challenge, to be honest, if you start going hierarchies, is where's the encoding happening? And are you double encoding, which is a no no, because then you get all kinds of visual artifacts and things. So we're having to work around some of those issues in our architecture, to be honest. All right. Well, let's thank you. Thanks. Thanks.